please let us welcome uh, Boris, our uh, Chief Robotics Officer, along with Andrew, our Product Director, to talk about UiPath's uh, roadmap, product roadmap, please. I'm going to watch it. It's really great to see how many people are joining us. Uh, also yesterday, we had a fantastic day and, and a real big interest, and it's, it's awesome. So yeah, Andrew, we're going to do it in a different format with two people. Uh, Andrew is uh, our senior product director, so I invited him to kind of do this with me. You know, you always need enforcers. Yeah, be a sidekick for the day. Yeah? <laughs> exactly. So we're, we'll do it a bit more in a dialogue, so hopefully it's not going to be kind of, it's going to be more entertaining, hopefully. Anyway, so I'm going to talk you through the roadmap, um, so our vision and where we are going with the product. And you will notice that in our product, it's not just one kind of uh, isolated technology whatsoever, but it's a whole vision of how the end-to-end -end goal actually is achieved. And many of those, you know, kind of developments that the you know, partners and partner companies have introduced is basically part of that whole map. And this is how we are positioning it. So when we looked at our... Uh, you know, the roadmap and where the product should be going, what we're trying to achieve is the digital workforce. This is what Enterprise RPA is about. Enterprise RPA is around integrating cognitive, um, embracing all the security requirements and functions that you need to have, but also allowing the scale, and scale is a big one. So when we looked at the product, we said, okay, what are the kind of key, how can we kind of look at it uh, and we looked at uh, the key elements that we need to achieve, like a, you could say, like a track. And the tracks are capability. Capability um, defines the ability and the scope you can automate. So this is where all the cognitive components come into play um, to allow robots to be more intelligent. Um, so that is about kind of coming from purely from the machine into more human-like activities. So that's the scope. The second is about you know, ease of use. And ease of use and the agility about this is, is two key things here. Um, one is it's so easy to use that it's not just depending on technical people so that even process owners, business owners can actually you know, generate their own robotic process automation. Uh, and the second thing is the, is the speed, how quickly you can actually implement it. And um, I think we are pretty lucky to say that our product is where all the feedback we get is always we are the fastest. Yeah, so um, in my previous role, we used to do comparisons between Blue Prism and UiPath. Uh, so clients would ask us to build the same process in both tools to do a like-for-like -like comparison. And actually, we found that, especially when we were automating Citrix, that we were probably around 30 to 50% faster in terms of implementation time. But I'd be interested to see, actually, because we've got developers here today. So who thinks UiPath is easy to use? Show your hands. Oh, it's not bad. <laughs> perfect, perfect. We'll, we'll, deep, uh, we'll deep dive a little bit more into this. And the third one is scalability. I mean, we have a lot of easy to make kind of POCs, use cases, and so forth, and people say, oh, that's great. But when you put it at large scale, there are far more challenges that, and alone the IT department is going to ask about the security, about you know, how, can it scale from a, from, from a platform perspective, but also the whole setup and the configuration, it becomes you know, a much, much bigger point. And much bigger becomes as well, as you increase more RPA, um, RPAs and processes running, you have to operate and maintain them. So we're gonna talk and address all of those in the roadmap. So let's take the uh, capability track. So when, when you think of capability, what are the key stations, the key challenges of capability? So the first one is computer vision. So our robot has to be able to identify all kind of objects uh, in, a, in a very intelligent way. And that's kind of a, the key thing. This also means embracing semi-structure to structure, so intelligent OCR and all these kind of functionalities. That's what you know, the first station will be. The next one is machine learning, and this is about where we need in RPA the decision management capability. So being able to uh, capture a number of cases and then even self-learning learning from those cases, but also providing kind of the supervision, human supervision to enable that. The next one is around language, and this is NLP, but it's two, twofold. 
So NLP in a sense of you have email or whatsoever, any kind of document, you are able to understand, extract that information and do the NLP processing as one document. And the second point is if you have something like a digital assistant or a chatbot, being able to have the whole conversation from whatever started you know, at the beginning has been said, put that into the connection of what actually then later on you want to expect to trigger a standard transaction, which is then being done by the RPA. So this is the NLP part of it, and it works a bit different than the other machine models, and, uh, and that's why you know, it's a real important station here. And the last one is reasoning, and reasoning is not that you know, it all self-learns self and then generates their own RPA and so forth. Everything in the business world we are doing in enterprise is, is supervised by human. Yeah? But what we are connecting here is uh, process mining capability being uh, the, the other capability of recording all the activities that a user is doing and then generating out of that RPA skeletons and doing that with some very powerful tools. And you're going to see um, and hear uh, how that works. Yeah, and that's also a very important one. So some of the challenges that customers are having today is around how do we scale? So, you know, lots of people are doing POCs or pilots or they built 10, 20 robots. But how do we go and do that discovery phase within the rest of the organization to understand where there's other opportunities for automation? So as, as we're going to mention, process mining is great because we can look at the activity that's been done by humans on desktops and look at how we can identify those groups of activities that are suitable for automation. Exactly. So we're going to go through each station now. Um, so the first one, computer vision. Um, so you already know um, in, the, in the, the way how you actually access uh, data from the screen or whatsoever. So either you have an API, but that's what any other BPM system is doing, um, or you go into the operating system of the desktop, extract the information, because there it's kind of structured and available. But then the last is that you really, if you go through Citrix, it's really an image. And then having powerful mechanisms like an anchoring mechanism to find the right selection and selectors and so forth, um, that's actually where we're really strong at. And it's already very good um, and very powerful, but the next step what we are going to offer is actually integrating deep learning. So these objects that are screen objects with the deep learning the robot knows, oh, this is a table, this is a push button, this is a combo box or whatsoever, and will be able automatically to extract that. So in the same sense as a self-driving car works to identify objects, predict movements and whatsoever, in the same sense, actually, our robot is becoming or getting very intelligent eyes. And that's going to be very, very interesting. This is something that we are targeting for the release 2018.2. Um, and uh, whilst having this, we are also going to introduce uh, another component which you can configure. Um, so if you have deep learning, you're going to need a much more powerful kind of processing. So in order to accommodate that and not having you know, the, the, the desktops of the, of the users to be beefed up with some more hardware resources, you're, you're basically uh, introducing kind of the, the ability that you can install it in the back end um, uh, for uh, a system that has GPUs. Yeah? Uh, and so this is how we're going to support it. And whilst we're doing this, why not even connecting other AI technologies very easily into this as well, so that you can have it, have it as a central service that all the other robots and robot um, APIs can then just um, trigger. So it will just be exchange uh, via work items and so forth to um, communicate with this other component. And the below part you see is how, how it's done today. This is already available that you can you know, use REST API calls and so forth. But we are also kind of looking exactly at this particular extension. Yeah, so we already have partners today who have um, built their own custom activities uh, to look, work with things like Microsoft's uh, face recognition server or IBM Watson's personality insights. So some of the cognitive services that are available out there on the cloud today, you, know, you can actually use UiPath and create your own custom uh, DLLs, which you can package up as a NuGet package and import into your UiPath project. And again, we've just seen the example of how Reboyo has done that with some of their own custom activities, yeah. but you can integrate with some of these cognitive services. Um, today, we're just going to try and offer some native integrations, meaning that developers can get those activities when they install UiPath and drag and drop them onto their, onto their workflows. Absolutely. 
So um, computer vision, still on that part, intelligent OCR. So we have a strategic partnership with Abbey. Um, actually, Abbey has, has gone so far that they uh, built up a, a special team for UiPath um, to uh, integrate their product um, very effectively with our product. So this is typically how the um, setup would look like in the uh, uh, intelligent OCR. And I know we had an Abbey session uh, earlier today, which gave you far more detail. Um, but on a high schema uh, perspective, this is actually where RPA and the Abbey product is going to kind of work hand in hand is the, you know, collecting the data, managing the exceptions, and then doing all the last kind of validation against the ERP master data to see, oh, was it really Bruce or boof? <laughs> yeah, to kind of find the right uh, validation. And this is, uh, this is how, how it's actually embedded. You always have kind of a, a human supervision because you have kind of validation UIs and so forth coming up, but it's all playing very nicely um, together in, in, in our UI path environment, and it will kind of trigger a UI for validation and so forth. And it will have templates, it's template-based, but in the next section, I'm going to show you, we can have the full set of the uh, RB Flexi Capture, which also has a smart classifier. So um, a good example of where people are using this today is for invoice processing. So you can imagine that uh, we have our base OCR, but that's only really very good when those documents come in some form of structure. As we all know with invoice processing, the invoices from different suppliers are all, slightly are all quite different, even though the information that we're trying to extract from that invoice is the same. You know, we want the date, we want the PO number, we want the line items, we want the freight, we want the tax. So the idea with uh, FlexiCapture is that you can build templates, but you can also use learning to teach the FlexiCapture engine where those pieces of information appear on that document. So we have, I think, around 10 to 15 projects ongoing at the moment yeah. with Abby, yeah. uh, where we're doing uh, invoice processing for lots of different customers, and we are looking at how we can give more native integration. So today what we do is we use the UiPath robot to drop the file into a hot folder that FlexiCapture looks at. It then takes a document, tries to process it, comes back with a confidence level to say, I'm 95% confident that I was able to extract the information from that document. And then what we can do is we can have, a, we have workflowing for FlexiCapture. So we can then send that document to a human to do verification using a validation station. Once they've validated it and, and corrected the robot, which if they correct it, it uses supervised learning, so it applies those corrections to any further documents that it sees. It then passes it back to UiPath. The way it does that today is through like an XML file or a CSV file, but again, we're gonna look at how Abbey FlexiCapture can then automatically integrate with our queues so the robots can be running, waiting for items to come back into the work queues and then can be processed by our robots. Exactly. When it comes to decision making, um, you can also use the Abbey Smart Classifier, but in decision making, we use, you know, you integrate any kind of other um, machine learning uh, suggestions or, or, or technologies that are there from Google, from Microsoft, IBM, Watson, and so forth. And we are now ramping up a very uh, strong partner program to offer all those connectors. Um, when you look at the, uh, like I mentioned, decision making, the key eight items or functions that need to be added is to be training, uh, setting up the training data and being able to classify. Um, and uh, you could theoretically also do that with the uh, smart classifier from uh, Abby. Um, and they all have also some solutions in that regard. So this is also kind of a, an interesting feature um, uh, that you can use with the Abby Flexi Capture. But again, I mean, we are integrating multiple other solutions that are strong in the market to enable kind of decision management. Think of a mortgage process. So think of, you know, when I apply for a loan or a mortgage, I have to send in my pay slips, I have to send in my driving license and my, my bank statements. So using classification with machine learning, we can um, classify the type of document that's come in based upon the text that's in that document, but also based upon images. So going back to the invoice process, if I get an invoice from HP and I get an invoice from Dell, I could actually use the logos to detect what type of invoice it is, or I could look for certain pieces of information within that document to make that classification. So I think one of the, de the demos that Abby show is taking CVs, so like CVs of people who are uh, accountants, engineers, uh, actors, and basically sending it to training sets of these different types of CVs. Then when you take it out of training, you can pass it to a random CV, and then it's able to say, I'm 85% confident that this person is an actor, and I'm maybe 10% confident that this person is also, you know, uh, maybe an engineer. That's probably not a very bad, exactly. <laughs> very good example, but you can use classification to try and understand 
you know, what type of document that is or how you can classify that document. And then, of course, when you deal with language, with NLP, the part of the NLP extraction, um, you've already seen today some of our own development. You've seen um, uh, also if there was a more de uh, um, demonstration on flexi capture. Um, there's also the component of info extractor um, that Abby uh, is providing. So with this, you can then kind of configure any type of uh, uh, extraction. What that will require is that you define actually an ontology, um, kind of a, to, to, to define what particular entity you need to extract. The tools that are actually pretty powerful to do this today is you find rather in the whole digital assistant and uh, chatbot area. Um, we are also working and playing around with these uh, uh, various technologies. We think in the moment one of the strongest ones is like dialogflow.com, which is uh, from Google, the API AI. Um, but we also work with Core AI and other kind of uh, uh, technology providers in this area, also with New Realms and so forth. So you will see um, some more examples that we are going to you know, offer um, to our community that they can make use of when they want to integrate into uh, a chatbot or a digital assistant environment. What we realized that from our orchestrator API perspective, we needed to extend that functionality uh, a bit more. So there's something in between which is called the, the dialogue service connector um, that we are you know, needing to provide so that the current version can, can do this. So we all you know, share more details about this uh, feature with the community, um, but it's something that we are currently working on. Um, so in this sense, all the knowledge and all the NLP extraction and so forth is actually done within the system. So it would be in this case, for example, done by dialogflow.com or Core AI. Uh, you can connect it then with any kind of other channel you want to use. Um, and the two things you need to add to make it uh, not for home user, but for customer service uh, enabled user environment that you connect it with some kind of chat. So it can, when, when the situation comes in the sense that the automation is not able to answer the question, it can automatically switch over to a live chat and a person can actually respond. And we can also use the RPA um, actually to collect the, the knowledge, the information, and feed that um, system accordingly. Yeah, think of the, uh, the dialogue service as an attended robot for a chatbot. So it's there to kind of gather information while the chatbot's talking to the customer and then maybe go into a system and pull information out and pass that back as a response for the chatbot to give to a client. Exactly. Right, so now, reasoning. Reasoning, so we are introducing and are working with Salonis, one of the leading uh, companies in the field of process intelligence and process mining. And what Salonis typically does is they look into the ERP, the ERP system logs. So if it's, an, if it's an SAP, they look into all the activities of a particular user and a particular process. And then they see these cases and have direct access to it to then actually see where are the best opportunities for automation. And the best opportunities for automations are the three Vs you apply. So you look at volume, you look at the variety of different kind of cases and how they are actually working as a process flow, and you look at how speedy are they, uh, velocity. So, and in order to understand what's the best opportunity for process automation, uh, the combination you need is actually pretty clear. It's like you need, ideally, a process that is high volume, has little variety, so not much deviation, and is extremely slow, so very manual. And in that combination, that's exactly what you want to tackle to find your best opportunity. That together then, with Salonis, it will kind of visualize um, the entire process flow, and you can actually select the scope of the variations, the cases, and so forth. It helps you actually to focus and say, I'm only going to tackle the implementation of that, or automation of that process in UK, because that's kind of very, you know, best practice, whereas other countries, it's totally uh, convoluted with other varieties of the, of the process flow. It's not running uh, in, a, in a kind of, you know, streamlined way. And when you have that situation, you know, you, you really want to automate something that's workable. So you're mitigating risk very effectively. And this is where Salonis helps uh, very strongly. Now, what we also realize, that we need more. We need to put and offer a smart recorder. That smart recorder is installed on the desktop of the user and registers all activities. Now, there are two ways how you can kind of focus or get that recording and feed it into Salonis. The first way is 
you activate this, uh, to your, configure the, the smart record and say, okay, whenever the particular screen comes up, that's the process I want to look at and give me the, all the information, the activities from that until another screen comes up or whatsoever. So you can kind of configure it because it's like, like an attended robot. So you can configure that in that sense and then feed it into Salonis and you get it all visualized so you can find the exact optimal track. But you can also have this other option that you just say, switch it on, three months, see what comes. <laughs> and in that case, in order to feed it into uh, a data analytics engine in the back end, right, you, you need to kind of generate, find the process, and you need to uh, create a case ID. So here you need to apply machine learning. And we would, here we then introduce these machine learning models so you can take that data, it looks at which, which kind of pattern seems to be a process, and then generates kind of the cases and so forth upon that and feeds it into uh, Salonis. Um, so this is, from a future perspective, something that we are going to tackle. Um, interestingly, of course, the, with that, the whole circle is not quite, quite closed. Okay, we now have find the best opportunities, we know the process that we want to tackle, that's all great, but where do we go from here? From here then, because Telonis can export into BPNN uh, 2.0, we can take that data, so we've got then the control flows, and then can take the user sequences out of the database that we have already captured you know, the ideal combination. So combining that, we should actually be able to generate XML code, so our, our RPA code. And that's kind of the, the vision that we have in mind. And this is something that, is, uh, that we are going to target. In this sense, you'll get an RPA code skeleton that will accelerate the whole implementation of RPA. So I spent quite some time on that. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, when you look at agility, um, it's, it's three key stations. It's user enablement, so how easy is it, is it to generate RPAs and how to, easy is it to use. And by the way, we have a customer in uh, Finland, Vatsala, who have enabled their process owners, their business users, to actually do the RPA coding. There's no technical guy. There's only a, two or three guys who run in the, the COE, and it's an it's a amazing model because it's very agile, immediately they can apply and automate all the business processes, um, but it's a very unusual model. But the fact is that our technology enables this, just shows that user enablement of our product is pretty strong, that's great. The other point is about integrations. Big, big topic, and we are going to invest in this very strongly, uh, in the sense that all the integrations with other third-party products, other technologies, and in particular, the whole AI technology area is going to be big. And then, last but not least, complexity. And this is about kind of having more global shared libraries that you can uh, integrate into the entire uh, uh, system, into the development, and you know, offering far more abilities for reuse. And we are also going to introduce an RPA marketplace. So we'll talk about this. Yeah, in a making sure that we can enable large teams of developers to work on processes. You know, so doing more with source control um, and also integration with other things like Git uh, and offering that capability within our tool out of the box. Exactly. So <coughs> user enablement, uh, as I already mentioned, we are definitely going to make uh, that even improve it more. Uh, make it easier like IFTTT or the MS flow kind of things. And if you can modulize more, you can come in, kind of bundle complex processes and integrate them far easier. The other thing, um, like I mentioned, is this kind of self-generation through using um, the uh, uh, Salonis uh, solution. And third but not least, of course, we have our, our Academy 2 you just had, and then later on, Stefan is gonna talk about this in more detail. So your, everything, is the, the trainings are free, you can access it, you can test drive it, you can use our community edition. And we're also thinking about something like an RPA navigator, something that helps during the whole implementation process, during the whole kind of journey. Also looking at maybe some uh, like contextual user dashboards for attended automation. So. One of the things that some of our competitors have with a tool like, um, you know, like OpenSpan or, uh, or Nice is when you're doing attended automation, sometimes it's good to have a dialogue on the screen, like a dashboard, so the user can kind of trigger 
automations based upon a very simple UI that you as a developer may have created. And also it's a way then of taking information and displaying it back to a user at runtime. So I think adding some, the ability to create some simple dialogues to assist with the attended automation. Exactly. When we look at integrations, um, we're gonna build up a whole ecosystem. Some of these we have already integrated, others we are con um, planning and have kind of uh, in, in mapped out to, to integrate. Um, so it's interesting you, so th that the BPM world has actually come to us and we have you know, kind of embraced it. So one of the key things is Oracle. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. But also IBM, SAP, and K2, and uh, the latest one is also NewGen um, that has ready made a activity libraries actually to integrate into us. And that's, that's gonna be very powerful for the entire orchestration and case management. So in the machine learning area, it's gonna be much more. I mean, the machine learning area is, and the deep learning is actually a whole universe. And, um, and this is why we're gonna strengthen to actually build up those, those connectors and those use cases. And we think we need to kind of, you know, open up a community and say, guys, if you do uh, develop certain technologies and so forth, why don't you put it into our marketplace? So it's gonna be like an, like an RPA store. Yeah? Um, but not just RPAs, it could also be uh, Java uh, script code or Node.js code or whatsoever, whatever helps to kind of do the integrations. And you see as well data analytics. So, um, so we all, we'll introduce some more uh, 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 dashboards and so forth, predefined ones uh, for our platform, but also you know, integrate easy into all the other tools and technologies here. So we already have a number of uh, our technology partners who are building activities within UiPath. So for example, one of them on there is Enate. Mm -hmm. So Enate has a set of activities that they've built for working with their, their, um, their workflow engine. And um, the RPA marketplace is an amazing place for our technology partners to start releasing some of these activities into the community. Um, but also, as we mentioned, the RPA marketplace is a place for our, our customers to look at activities that they've built and share that with the community if, if they want to. Yeah, and Oracle is even a kind of a bigger, bigger animal as a whole universe. Um, because what Oracle offers uh, is, is a, a, a breadth of technology. So you can, with Oracle, um, you cannot just only have a, a BPM workflow kind of triggering RPA. Um, you can actually also leverage and use all the kind of uh, adaptive intelligence features, the kind of best next um, uh, action features and so forth, decision tables that um, Oracle also offers here. But you can also use something like their uh, integration cloud services, which is basically like a, like a Moosoft. Yeah? Um, so these, these are, they have already ready-made adapters so you can easily integrate. And then self-service integrations, which is quite far powerful, you can kind of build a wrapper around an RPA and an IoT wrapper and offer this as an IoT service, so something like Zapier. So, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, all the Oracle applications and areas and so forth, so we're talking to them as well. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's a whole universe in a sense. And we have a special bundle um, uh, created uh, with uh, Oracle so that you can kind of can get our product in a, in a bundled way. Yeah, the recipe uh, concept's um, really interesting. So let's say, for example, I built a process that goes to UPS, uh, takes a tracking number and returns me the status of my parcel. So you imagine that you've got a process that's working with like cloud-based application, then you could package that up as a recipe and deploy it into Oracle as a, as a, as a, as a self-service yeah. integration. And then that can be consumed uh, by a person so they can say, go and get me the status of my UPS tracking record yeah. and it'll go and, and ask, ask for the tracking number and it'll go and perform that automation purely in the cloud. So I think we'll see a lot more of those types of automations coming. Exactly, you could create an RPA that does, they, you could create a digital recruiter if you want, eh? the RPA program that goes into, crawls all the uh, job databases and so forth. You just send in a spec, we're connecting it via Google Sheet, it does it all and then sends all this information back and so forth. You can really do that in, in that kind of way. And I think this is where the future will be going, um, kind of creating these kind of digital automations. So the whole concept of global shared activity libraries and so we are going to enhance this, it makes the whole embedment far more easier. You've already uh, 
some of you may be already familiar with the run framework or the re framework that uh, was also mentioned by uh, Sven from Roboyo, um, which is kind of our best practice of how to build large scale RPAs. So we're gonna, uh, yeah. just, just around the, uh, the shared activities, sorry. So um, probably most of you today, when you're building automations, you will create what I call components. So you may have a component that logs into SAP. You may have a component that enters report criteria. You may have a component that downloads a report. So the idea is that any, any activities, any sequences that are working with applications, you probably build them separately and then consume them by multiple processes. That's good practice for reusability. One of the challenges that we have in the tool today is how do we maintain and how do we deploy those shared components that you've built? So, you know, today people use shared folders because the problem with our deployment package, the, the problem with our packaging and deployment is it only takes the files that exist within the process, turns them into a NuGet package and deploys them to Orchestrator. There's no dependency on any workflows that are being built outside of that project. So what we're going to do is give you the ability to take a, a workflow that you've built convert that into a NuGet package and deploy it to Orchestrator. Then in UiPath, when you see your activities on the left-hand side, you'll be able to drag and drop components that have been built. It also means when we deploy, because it's using NuGet, it knows that this process is referencing this version of login to SAP. So it'll make the deployment process a lot easier. It'll make reusability a lot easier. So I think that's gonna be a really, a really big enabler. Absolutely. And it's something customers have been asking for for a long time. So. Yeah, and uh, when you put this then into the marketplace, these components, the, the reuse, that's going to be you know, massive. And that's going to be coming. So we're going to launch a marketplace or as a kind of RPA app store, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, as big as we do with the Academy too. So that's going to be a very, very interesting um, thing to come. Um, it's going to come in this year. So it's going to come um, uh, maybe shortly before the 2018.2 release um, or maybe at the same time. So we are kind of uh, seeing, you know, we want to have it populated already with some useful stuff that you can then make use of. Um, the next thing is around uh, also, it's, we are looking at, you know, how can we build these wrappers? As I mentioned with the um, uh, Oracle SSI, the self-service integrations and so forth, I think this is something that's going to be very big, especially in the manufacturing world. This is going to be a big thing with the IoT connection. So with that, we come to scalability. So we have a already a very powerful RPA platform, um, but the key things when you look at scalability is compliance, it's risk and security. Um, then it is, of course, that you have to have an architecture that enables the, the large configurations and last but not least, orchestration, because once you've got that technology, you need to kind of in, get it integrated into an organization so that people can really work with it in a very simple way. So let's look into technology, uh, technology around the compliance area and security. So all systems today, uh, any other competitor, is very much gonna, it's all resource-based um, security. Uh, sorry, it's all role-based security. Um, so meant to a particular person, only has particular act, uh, uh, ability to access components within the system. But what we are going to actually introduce is having it resource-based, so much more granular. You can take a particular component, and then you can, you know, you apply data masking, encryption, and so forth. We're also going to have more uh, capability around the uh, integration with CyberArk, so you can ship blocks to CyberArk, to the secure world. You can take an asset um, in the orchestrator that you have to find and actually have that then uh, locked in the cyber arc secure world. So those kind of activities we are going to support. Yeah, we're also making some improvements to uh, the audits that are uh, displayed within orchestrator and also um, hiding in some of the security around logging in. So login, um, auditing login attempts to orchestrator. So if we see that someone's trying to get into orchestrator, we can see those failed login attempts. Um, stronger, pack, stronger password policies as well, so only allowing you to you know, give a, a, a low value of like 10 for a character limit when you're specifying a password. So we're doing a lot more around hiding in some of those security features within, uh, within, within UiPath. Exactly. And the final thing as well was in 17.1, we released into a, a beta test uh, the concept of an org unit. I don't know if anyone here has been using the org unit functionality. So the idea behind the org unit is it's a container that means that you can segregate queues, processes, robots, assets into a container and apply user permissions just to that container. So it's very good in an organization if you want to have a single tenant and then you want to have a HR org unit or a finance org unit and then me, I can only, I can only log in and 
run my processes in HR, and then Boris can log in and run processes and, and change assets within finance. So it's having that, that, that segregation, which is really important. Yeah. The next around large scale, so something that we're going to tightly integrate is the whole um, virtualization. So this is about the orchestrator being able to spawn up VDIs, virtual desktop environments with pre-configured robots and so forth, and spawn it down and so forth. So it's very flexible. Um, and uh, you probably heard about it already. I think uh, uh, today one of my colleagues was talking about it and um, or is certainly going to talk about it, uh, how that works. And I think we also, we're also looking into Dockers and how to use those capabilities. So definitely the tighter integration into uh, the uh, infrastructure. Our community edition already has uh, more than 10,000 robots. It's just a single cloud environment with all the multi-tenant setups, and the robots are all over the world uh, connected to that one environment. And, and we are using that environment in particular to also come from bounty hunting for kind of challenges, issues, or whatsoever to harden and, and improve our product. And this already proves that our architecture is, is very, very scalable. With this, of course, we also have some more predefined uh, monitoring tools. So we're going to, so when, when you saw the data analytics part, we know that when you have large scale, you have far more handling of exceptions and so forth, and business exceptions you need to kind of want to monitor the performance of RPAs, making sure that, you know, kind of we apply also some machine learning in around this area. So yeah, some templated reports currently for Kibana, but also looking to see how we can uh, offer templates for things like Spotfire or Tableau if organizations are already using that reporting and visualization technology. Exactly. And next is the orchestration. Now, well, as I said, in, when you have a large setup and you have to kind of integrate into a large organization, it needs to be done easily. So imagine that the way that it's set up is that you have a robot user, uh, call it, I don't know, um, Poppy, and then you can assign that particular task to that robot user because you know Poppy is processing all kinds of invoices, and if there's anything kind of cocking up, it will reassign them back to the human as a case. So the whole case management setup is one of the key components here that this is needed in order to orchestrate it around it. So this is why for these particular cases in terms of, you know, kind of um, exception handling and so forth, the integration with the case management system is very powerful. Um, so this is how we are going to address it. And there are multiple systems that um, we are already integrating with. And the, some of these screens here are particular. This is the Oracle PCS environment with the case management. And there you can see one of the best next next move decision table mechanisms that we have integrated. So it's about kind of the how this play of tasks and activities between m human and machine is, is working. Yeah. So when you put the whole picture together, because you probably wondered, why do we have these funny cranky graphs? <laughs> it's a London <laughs> underground, yeah? <laughs> it's, it's because it's, uh, it looks like a, like a very reduced London tube map, but <laughs> it's a... Uh, the interesting part is when you look at the whole kind of vision of where it is going and what are the key components, the intersections as well, integrations of course, uh, extend the scope, compliance is part uh, also of scope, of course, the security capabilities, complexity is part also of uh, scalability, and then the whole picture comes together. But it proves that we are looking at it, at all of this holistically. And this can only function if you add a lot of the ecosystem of uh, new technologies and other technologies also into the whole uh, system. Let's come to, the, uh, to our roadmap schedule. So this is the current release. And here now, we are going to release end of this month, the 2018.1. Uh, so there are um, key features kind of aligned according to you know, the tracks. Um, and some of the key features is around the localization, around the enhancement of the OCR. So we are using a different technology in this case that we have also embedded. And also launching that with the intelligent OCR, having it bundled with uh, Abbey Flexi Capture. Yeah. And things like some of the, uh, the robot, robotic service orchestration. So the activities for integrating with tools like Enate uh, will be available. So you can start applying workflow to automation. So they'll be coming in 2018.1. Um, also, uh, the best practice RPA run, run framework that's um, been developed by our RPA experts at UiPath 
uh, will be made more available for organizations who want to build the capability and want to have some best practice templates and standards to begin with. Um, extending the auditing features, as we've already mentioned, so we're going to improve some of the audits that uh, information that you see within Orchestrator, uh, hardening the security, um, and also support for things like Elasticsearch Shield. So I, I don't, any of you know at the moment, out of the box, Elasticsearch um, is open source, but it doesn't really come with any security features. So you can use um, part of the XPAC, the Elasticsearch Shield, where you can start to protect Elasticsearch and you can restrict access to certain logs to certain users and you can tie it in with Active Directory and you can encrypt the, the transmission of, of logs between Orchestrator and also um, and Elasticsearch. So it's very important that we have those features in there too. And uh, making sure that we have a platform that can run thousands of unattended robots and tens of thousands of attended robots, so making sure that we can deliver that scale. Yeah, the funny thing is that the current version, of course, can also scale already. <laughs> and so the point is what we uh, actually have done, we have pre-configured the system right away so that it you know, um, is designed so the database is kind of bigger and configured in a way that it runs with the, for, for the huge amount of robots right away. Um, yeah, the extended auditing features are very, very important. So we added far more capability of the data that we are capturing during the processing of the robots and the uh, process automations itself. Um, so this will kind of give far more insight and far more capability than if you look come from it from a data analytics perspective. Yeah. And we need this, of course, if we apply machine learning later on, on, on you know, how to best schedule and automate the scheduling, the automation, the automation. <laughs> to do that, you need the appropriate data, right? And I think um, the other point on there that's yeah. worth mentioning is the, uh, the flexible licensing support yeah. as well. So looking at how we can offer the ability for you to have additional licenses for a small period of time to, de to, meet, to meet any increase in demand. Yeah. So you can kind of come to your iPad and say, I need another few days worth of processing this month because I've got more volumes. So we can give you temporary licenses that can increase the amount of robots that you can have for a period of time. Exactly. So we are, so we are seeing how we can do it more flexible. Um, what we've done here in this version is technically enable that feature, um, but um, how we are going to roll it out is currently still in, in design. But we are going to <laughs> offer more flexibility for kind of burst situations. I think that is kind of the, the key highlights, and um, uh, we'll switch to the next release. Um, in the next release, we have much more, so by then, um, we will have the marketplace launched, we will have uh, a whole bunch more of integrations of uh, AI technology, machine learning technology, because we are setting up a whole team in our company to really kind of look at all these type different uh, technologies, build use cases around it, validate this. So we're actually helping our customers to get through this forest of AI technologies with some really useful um, examples of how that is going to be integrated in UiPath. Um, there's going to be more on the BPM side and the case management side to integrate. So, uh, and of course, a lot more localization support. When you think of Chinese uh, and uh, other languages and that, that we want to support. And I guess also looking at how we can support non-persistent BDIs. So one of the challenges today is that IT organizations have to go and provision robots and make those BDIs persistent because the service connects to Orchestrator. So how can we look at um, making our technology run so it can work on a a non-persistent VDI, generally in an organization, VDIs are created at the time a person logs in, so it, that helps from a, you know, from a, a resource point of view and a scalability exactly. point of view. But also, uh, Boris mentioned it earlier around looking at how we can work with like, the likes of VMware, so you can deploy an image to Orchestrator, and then the Orchestrator creates the robots on demand, so it creates robots when it needs them. We already have a partner in the UK that I've been working with who have uh, built lots of scripts around uh, AWS so they can, by, on the click of a button, they can create a new orchestrator. Then on another click of a button, they can create a robot, create a BDI, install UiPath, connect it to orchestrator, and execute a process all on the click of a button. Then when the process finishes, it destroys that VDI in AWS. So they're, they're looking, that, that's really helps from a scalability point of view, but also from a cost point of view, because as you know, AWS is infrastructure as a service, so you only pay for what you're using. Exactly. And so then when, when we reach the 2019 versions, we then have the fully enabled kind of digital workforce with all the things. And we may even have some, something like a, 
like an AI studio or so forth. So we're kind of evaluating with how do we extend this, how do we you know, provide the capability of adding ontologies, and how do we better integrate with all the AI technologies, um, uh, offer more kind of solution bundles, and also have something like a Oracle Cloud Edition. So this means that the orchestrator will run under Linux <laughs> um, in, the, uh, in the Oracle Cloud environment, and so, things like that that we are kind of uh, envisioning here. And of course, the whole intelligent uh, scheduling, so applying machine learning around the operation of RPA on our platform itself. With that, we actually concluded, and I see pe some people yawning. <laughs> 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 I don't take it personally. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, absolutely understandable. I mean, you've been in this room for quite some time, uh, but I think it was so far uh, very, very useful, very interesting. So. For this, we actually, it's almost time up, but we do allow some questions, so please feel free. Any questions? Yes? The microphone is coming. I've got some of the mic. <laughs> you mentioned about uh, deep learning feature for anticipating changes, uh, to know screen, those changes yeah. while developing. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons for robot downtime in production is changes done in automated applications, can that deep learning thing somehow help uh, reduce the downtime? In that's, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with that. You know, not because it's fancy. No, but no, but it's you, you mentioned about while it, it will help while developing it, but. No, it will also help you, because if you have a change in the, a complete change of the screen or whatsoever, it will automatically detect it. So it and will automatically yeah. add, uh, adjust it. As okay. well. So you're, you're talking about self-healing robots, really, aren't you? So that, yeah, yeah, the idea with computer vision is, I mean, if there's a drastic change to the application, yeah. like someone removes a button, then, you know, you can't if really minus detect that. <laughs> robot will adapt to those changes. Yeah, but, yes. but the idea behind computer vision is, regardless of the resolution, regardless of the a color change, or regardless of a position change on the screen, the robot shouldn't break because it's looking for the characteristics of what makes up those controls. The same way as a human, I would look at a, right. a screen. If you made a small change to it, you know, like Facebook do all the time, you, yeah. you know how to use it, don't you? You know how to continue to use it. So the idea behind computer vision using deep learning is that we can create something that's intelligent and it can understand and it can look at a screen and it can say, I know that's a button. So you as a developer, you say, go and click the button. Don't spy it, go and click the button. It yeah. knows there's a button and it can click on it. But you can okay. imagine by building up the training set for all that and testing that, it's, it's a, this is what we're currently actually doing right now. Some more questions? Yes? Uh, I have a question on similar line that what you explained, but just to reconfirm that you are trying to like uh, have a future uh, map where you want UI path can be used by anyone. Let's say you put a machine learning and uh, deep, can you put deep, the deep learning there? engine in the background and let's say a kid, 10 years old kid son, does something on the desktop and that um, engine will record everything what he's doing, let's say for one month or so. And at the end, he, it will create the one uh, like workflow for him. Yeah. And there's no need for anyone like, uh, you need a developer like us who will make a workflow, then implement that inside the path and then we'll uh, use it using the robot and all. Yeah, and so then the generate future, the skeleton. So yeah. the future is that anyone can use UI path, whether he knows that or not. In the sense like, uh, Deep learning or the machine learning will impl will help to create that. Yes, it will help up to some time. So you get all the activities. Um, so you have all, the, and not just from one person, but all the persons who have installed it. So you really get a, a real data picture of that how that process is used. And then you have this the visualization that Salonas will offer. And by the way, Franz is here. Franz Constantine from Salonas. He's over there. Um, if you have further questions to find out how that, you know, how that looks and works, he can show it to you because we have already beta tested this uh, first version and you, know, and you can see how that, how that really works in, in, uh, in Salonas. So that's one part of having then finding the, the best option process and then generating the RPA for UiPath, that's the second step. So, and we are kind of currently talking about how do we bundle this in a, in a sensible offer as a product to the market, right? So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yes. I have two questions. The number one is, uh, as a customer, if I wanted to approach to UiPath and uh, asking that, okay, I want these, these, these functionalities. Yeah. Is there a single way of pricing channel is there? Otherwise, I have to go to Oracle, I have to go to Selenium, I have to go to all different, different 
pricing these things? Do you have a, a single a channel to get the, I want this, this, like example, I want to buy a car with this, this, this variants. See, this is a, it's, a, it's a good point. So um, when, when we talk about this marketplace, this is about knowledge share, reuse, that's one thing, but also at a, uh, at a some stage also monetize that. So for, for other partners, as a second. Um, so that makes it easier. Um, with good, with big partners like uh, Oracle, for example, that was your, what you were referring to, or Salonis. So the first is always that we set up a co-selling setup, a special co-sell setup and how it works and so forth so that you can e easily use both products. The second step for us is to have the joint product. So you don't need to go, so you get from us the, the bundled product. So it's kind of uh, customers was directly doing their own implemented third partners. Or if they already have a license like for Abi or whatsoever, um, yeah, we're going to address how we then, you know, how it makes it easy to, to have the add-on as UI path or so forth. But we're definitely going to look at that. Yeah. And the second thing is, some of the great features of your path, have you implemented any of these processes in your, in your organization? In our in organization. Our own organization. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving an example of a ticket assignment. The moment uh, if I submit a ticket to you, yeah. Uh, Normally, I don't know whether you're using BOT or maybe manually you are assigning the tickets to the respective teams or these things. Have you implemented the BOT there? That's true because the point is, you know, uh, this is exactly what Sven was saying, you know, the, 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 uh, the kids of the cobbler when run barefoot. <laughs> um, no, we actually do that because this is where our use cases are uh, also come from. So we have, have started to kind of apply those kind of automations to, you know, ticket assignments and so forth. We are doing this as well. Of course, we apply it to our own processes. I'm mean, just asking that. Because yeah, yeah, no, sure. Because, uh, again, well, it's not the, uh, from what I want to say. When a ticket is assigned, normally created, it took normally four hours to assign to the respective person. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's not, so, not so sorry, at the moment, but, but that's all in within Zendesk, so it's not it's even within this system, right? Um, but it's a, it's a good question, sure, of course. You know, we we apply it in different fields, our own automation. Maybe sure. in this particular case, we don't don't have that robot. But yeah, you're right. I'm sure. I mean, uh, on lighter side, I think we are getting very good support from you, but that's not an issue. And that's a wonder to see. Yeah. It's good. Really <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. Sir. Um, uh, currently in production, if a robot fails at a certain time, right, then we have options of retry and restart, that's just different, but can we uh, have, a, have a such an option wherein bot, bot restart its pro process from where he, it left and continue it works post crash? Yeah. So, so come again, I didn't quite catch so that. Put, you, put your mic for yeah. oh, okay. Sorry. So, um, yeah, in, in production, what happens is uh, sometimes Brock bot breaks down due to some uh, different different reasons, right? Yeah. And then you, you have options of retry or restart it all over, right? So, do we have like um, a, a option of uh, a, in in future which will uh, restart the bot process exactly from where it left and start ah, resume process. kind of yeah, yeah resume. No, it's, it's, it's something that we have uh, been asked by for a, a number of customers. So almost kind of it maintains the state of the process was before it crashed. So when it starts again, it picks up that state. I mean, there is some challenges around that. If you think around, you know, that if it breaks halfway through a process and the machine crashes, then to start in that state again, the applications would need to be up and they'd need to be on the right screen so you can continue processing. So although we could offer that functionality, I think there are some challenges around that. I mean, one of the things that you... We, we could do, for example, is to take a queue item. So let's say you're working from the queue, you're working a transaction from the queue, and that and it fails for some reason. So generally, that transaction would be marked as a um, well aborted if it's uh, if, if the machine crashes or an exception if there's a technical reason as to why it can't complete the process. What we could do is we could almost kind of we could we could store the state of where it got to. So in your workflow file. When you, get, um, when you get the transaction again from the queue because you forced a retry, is you could build something into your state machine or your process so it says, well, I know that this transaction, when it failed last time, got to this particular um, section of the process. So actually, don't bother doing your first sub-process or your first set of activities because you've already done that. So we do have um, a number of customers who have implemented processes in that way where they're using the queue to get a transaction that's been retried and then starting the process at a particular point. So you could do that today in the way you develop. Yeah. In terms of capturing the state of a process, I think there's 
there will be some challenges around there, but I, again, it's something customers are asking for, so we just need to look at a, a good way of implementing that, really. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so in most of your slides, uh, I've seen it supporting the RESTful uh, services. So does it support SOAP, uh, SOAP calls? So we, always, we always support SOAP today. So, so what, sorry. SOAP. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So is it, is it uh, only in the consuming part or in the exposing part or both? Is it the consuming? It, uh, does it uh, consume it soap? Con it consumes yeah. soap. So I think yeah. you are referring to a competitor of ours that you can host a process as a soap web service. So no, we don't have that at the moment. What you would do is if you wanted to invoke a UiPath process, you would use our REST service that's exposed as part of Orchestrator. If you wanted the robot to call out to a soap service, you would use the soap activities. Now they're not they're not, not amazing. I mean, when I used to develop UiPath processes, if there was a complicated SOAP service I was calling, I would generally build a wrapper. So I would build something in, in, a, in a .NET DLL that consumes that service because sometimes some, some custom types, uh, especially when you have like a razor custom types, can be challenging to, to work with in UiPath. So, but yes, you can call SOAP web services. It's just sometimes that you may also want to use a wrapper if it's, uh, you're trying to do something complicated. But make sure you do that as a wrapper as a NuGet package, so that it sits within the yeah. governance and control of UiPath. Yeah. Don't be creating any macros. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my uh, question hi, is uh, this is Sandeep here from uh, oh. Bosch. Oh, okay, I sorry. have. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. We'll, we'll take both questions. So just that the sequence. No yeah, my question is around uh, the, uh, the UiPath integration with uh, BPM suites. Like you mentioned, uh, the IBM uh, BPM, yeah. NewZen, and uh, K2. So yeah. how is it going to come off, uh, like, uh, is it going to be an uh, UiPath activity, or is it at the API level, or is it a one-way or a two-way? No, no, you will have UiPath activities um, as well that, you know, kind of support this, but it's also, you know, you, you work with the uh, work items and work queues um, to pass it on to uh, the K2 environment okay. on UGen. Mm -hmm. UGen actually, there's a nice documentation that you will see that. Yeah, if you have some example, uh, kind of, uh, you, which you are looking to uh, have it integrated in future, sure. it will be helpful. We, we can share the Enate. So, so one of the BPM tools that I've been working with is Enate, and what yeah. we've done is we've designed a, what a solution would look like, so a yeah. templated solution. So, you know, e when e Nate sees a new job coming in for the robots, yeah. it can uh, start the robot, and then the robot will go to the e Nate yeah. queues because okay. exactly. of prioritization. It will work the item, and then it will use activities to go and update that job status within the BPM system. Yeah. So we can share that with you. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's uh, hi, this is Sandeep uh, from Bosch. Yeah. So my question is regarding with uh, multi-tenancy in the orchestrator. So, I mean, being as a system administrator, uh, I should have a control for everything. But uh, generally, I, like, I feel like uh, for being a creator tenant, we don't have control on that. I mean, if a person is having my orchestrator link, he can create the link. Uh, he can be a creator tenant in the orchestrator unnecessarily. I mean, without my per uh, knowledge or without my permission, he can create. So that is one thing. I mean, is there anything which we have uh, done in the next version or I mean, how it is? I'm trying, I'm trying to understand yeah, your There's question. a create uh, tenant whenever there's a uh, one we enable multi-tenancy in the orchestrator, right? Uh -huh. So when uh, I create, I, I'm a system administration, I should be having the privilege to create tenant and I have it. Uh -huh. But I don't want others to create uh, tenant for the same. I want only administrator or selected person to create tenant. Okay. Yeah, I, see, I see what you mean. So at the moment you're saying when we switch on multi-tenancy, you can create, become a tenant. Yeah. And what you're saying yes. is you would like to have more control uh, around who actually can create yes, those tenants. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, I'll take that one offline because I'm, I'm not sure about that one at the moment. Yeah. So, um, have, you, have you locked this also in the forum already? Or? Uh, once I have discussed these things uh, oh. and when I raise a ticket, so I'm not sure. I mean, after that, anything happens. I just uh, given a suggestion kind of things. That's yeah, a good no, suggestion. That's good, yeah. good, yeah, uh, uh, it was good. Ticket was created for something else, but it was a suggestion given to the team, but I don't remember now the yeah. exact names or that. No, but yes, I have uh, discussed these things. Oh, we, we, are do, we are doing um, more around tenancy management within yeah. Orchestrator. Okay. So that will, that will probably come as part of that type Thank of uh, activity that we're doing. Okay, thanks. <laughs> one more question I have. I mean, again, a kind of suggestion. Like, till now we have one not receiving any, like, suppose I have a license for a bot license, suppose a back office robot license is installed. But uh, suppose if it is getting uh, expired in one month or something like that, 
those kind of notification are right now it is not a, we are not getting either we have to <coughs> manually maintain it in some excel sheet and we have to you know, keep on following up uh, if it is there coming in the next uh, it's good otherwise do we have any such plans uh, like where if there is a license is getting expired we should get a notification okay that uh, you have only one month like how you used to, we used to get it for trial that only 12 weeks is remaining 8 weeks is remaining like that yeah. So, are kind you, of warning or something. Are you using, are you using 17.1? So, are you use a server-based? Uh, yes, you yes. Are. Okay, so what we did in 17.1 was we moved to the server-based licensing, which shows you the expiry date when you go into the licenses tab in Orchestrator. But what you're saying is then that should then have it, we should be able to configure some notifications within the settings page or license page. Yes, sorry, yes. I mean, that then yeah. sends an alert or uh, an email using the alerting functionality within UiPath. Okay. To, to, yeah, so, so again, that's a good idea and something we'll... Definitely. Yeah, Look definitely. Up. Because we have also centralized the way how you manage the licenses with the robots. Yeah. You yeah. do that now from the orchestrator, and that's that's a kind of a, a big big benefit, especially. Yeah. With the Plus, I'm sure you've got your sales guy who rings you up and yeah. says, "Do you want to renew licenses?" So <laughs> I'm sure you do get some form of notification. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. One last question I have: like, uh, uh, we have many processes running in SAP. I'm sorry, one more last question I'll take. No, uh, really, we need to kind of, because it would be, <laughs> you know, we have more things to come, so yeah, it must be question. your last question. I'm yeah. sorry. And please connect to me uh, directly later. So, like, uh, we have, like, uh, SAP couple, many SAP processes which are running. But what the problem will happen, like, uh, generally there will be different uh, pop-ups always coming in the SAP. So, which will be not be, uh, I mean, we will not be coming to, will not come to know. Like, uh, SAP developers will, uh, do uh, develop something and they will it will come up so which being as like automation team will not come to know but suddenly because of that our process will get peeled because of uh, it will say that selector not found but do we have any or such procedure uh, like I can those element I can find it out uh, it's a new element take human intervention for for this pop-up what action has to do and then again it has to like how we do for machine learning so, so there's, right? there's one so some similar like that yeah there's some new feature now in the uh, 2018.1 uh, that is actually creating a work item for a human intervention. Yeah. So if you have that kind of situation and you want the robot to trigger a human intervention and so forth, so you can do this now with uh, additional status flags and statuses in, in the uh, orchestrator in the uh, uh, work item queue. So that, that is, with that you can kind of, you solve like the uh, kind of human robot inter interaction in a, in a very simple way. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, excuse okay. me. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. I'm sorry, like that. No, no, we'll, we'll, I'll come to you. Don't worry. Come talk to us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Boris and Andrew. It was uh, it was very well explained.